You're now listening to The Brian Callen Show with your host, Brian Callen. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest, James Tooley, professor of education policy at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne. Is that how you pronounce it, Professor? It is. It's a river, the Tyne River. Yes, the Tyne River, of course. Uh, and you have done a great deal of private res- uh, research uh, on, on private education for the poor in India, China, Africa. Um, you were awarded the gold prize in the first international finance corporation, Financial Times private sector development competition. Uh, but forget all that. The book you wrote, um, A Beautiful Tree, or The Beautiful Tree. Um, the Beautiful Yeah, The Beautiful Tree. Um, Everybody here has read it. A personal journey. Uh, I guess it, 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 the 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 entire title is um, uh, a beautiful tree. A personal journey into how the world's poorest people are educating themselves. Before we start, I just want to say a couple things. First, I love that it's published by the Cato Institute. Uh, I'm a huge fan, and I love your your approach. Here is pretty revolutionary and very surprising. I'm sure to you as well. In terms of the fact that, it, you know, usually you think of aid as being this sort of centralized, let's give a lot of money to this government so they can create public schools for everybody. And in fact, what you found in your travels, uh, Nigeria, in Ghana, in, in you know, Bombay, wherever it was, that these slums, the, t- the par- parents are actually creating these small schools and educating their young and it's it's being done. It's a it's a for profit enterprise, in in these enclaves, but it's working for the most part. Is that a good way to kind of sum up this fantastic book, which we'll get into? Yeah. So I mean, it's it's it's, it's pretty good. It's just <laughs> it's not just parents. It's it's entrepreneurs right. who are creating. So they're low cost private schools. That's the key. So sometimes created by parents, but more typically now by entrepreneurs. And they're not necessarily sc- small anymore. Some of these schools are thousands of children in size. And they're across the developing world, in the slums, in the shanty towns, in Africa and Asia, as you said, and also in the villages. And they're serving the majority of the children in the slums and significant minorities in, in rural areas. So they're just a, an amazing phenomenon that's there. Um, we've tested children um, in mathematics, English, one other subject, these private schools are outperforming the government schools for obvious reasons which we can discuss. And uh, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a huge, as you say, revolution, a grassroots privatization going on here, which is incredibly exciting it's to amazing. report. It's amazing. It's amazing. Go ahead. Well, one of the things that I think is really important in terms of starting this interview off is where you started in your own journey, because, you know, it would be very easy for people to assume, oh, you know, Professor James Tooley, he's obsessed with the free market. He just wants the free market everywhere. And that's really not where you began your journey in education, right? I mean, where, when you first started off in Zimbabwe, could you tell us about that? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was, as, as a young man, I, I was pretty naive and not particularly political. But if you'd asked me, did I love or hate the free market, I would say I hated the free market. Um, <laughs> you know, I was, I, I was a young socialist. Um, you know, uh, not very sophisticated, but nonetheless, I identified as a socialist. I read Das Capital. I was in a Das Capital reading group. Jesus, and... take it easy here, James. <laughs> I mean, I mean, professor, <laughs> go on, go on. Arrest well, in him. fact, I was in two Das Capital reading groups. If you want to know the truth, and and um, I um I went to Zimbabwe as a young man, just straight out of out of college. I finished my mathematics degree. They were looking for mathematics teacher in this newly independent country. It seemed like a great adventure for me. But it was also great that it was a newly formed socialist country. I wanted to help build socialism in one country, as you might call it, uh, to coin a phrase. And um, so off I went. And um, that experience made me skeptical about government in education. But even so, I still came back um, to England, I think after three or four years, thinking that you know, without, without necessarily changing my mind. And then there was the Thatcher Revolution going on in England at the time, the Margaret Thatcher Revolution. Yep, yep, and I yep. set out to do my doctorate my, um, to condemn, to criticize the Thatcher reforms in education, the so-called market reforms. 
And it was during that period that I read E.G. West's book, Education in the State, published in 1965. And that, that made me realize that actually there was something more going on here. My thesis became an exploration of the role of government education. And I came out at the end of it thinking government should have no role whatsoever. Wow. I love <laughs> so it, was, it. it. Wow. It was, it was, an, it was an intellectual journey. Um, and I came out, you know, totally in favor of private education. You know, changing your mind like that is a rare thing. You come in sort of a wild-eyed socialist and you come out the other end. And, you know, part of what I love about this podcast is Hunter and I talk all, all about this all the time. I always talk about being a, a libertarian and things. And, and I just believe in maximum personal freedom. And my experience has said that the marketplace does usually is usually a better solution than any kind of top-down centralized bureaucracy. But... I am always amazed at how quickly I change my mind, not on such a large scale, but God, do I, I jump at simple solutions. Kill all the bad guys. And, and, and it just never is that, it's never that, you know, we just, uh, but, but, so I really appreciate, but that, that is a revolution in your own mind there. That's a big change. Yeah, and, it was a very big change. And, 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 your, and your subsequent research and your experiences have, have fortified that position, right? I mean, that's what this book is really yeah. about. Yeah, because so I became convinced about private education, but everyone knows private education is for the rich, for the elite, for the, you know, and and for whatever reason, you know, I, 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 in my in my spirit, I wanted to be serving the poor. And so I had this terrible disconnect, you know, which. Uh, so what the hell was I going to do? And then it was just an amazing I, I managed to get get some consultancy work for the International Finance Corporation, exploring private education for the elite in developing countries. And then one memorable day, it was it was a, a life changing day. It, it, I did have an epiphany. It was the 26th of January, 2000. I went into my the birthday. slums of the my old birthday. Not, not, and, and that's not it, a coincidence. Keep going. <laughs> kidding. <laughs> so that's wonderful. So every time I remember that day, I shall remember you too. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, nothing like putting myself at the center of a, of a huge idea. Talk about a narcissist. Sorry, <laughs> Professor. Sorry to interrupt your, your talk. What an asshole the, I am, but keep going. Was, <laughs> your birthday was on the 26th of January. 2000, I take it. I yeah, mean, that's right. I'm, I'm a young, I'm a young precocious <laughs> he's, kid. He's 14. I'm 14 years old. <laughs> At least mentally. That's right. Anyway, yeah, that's so right. It, it was 14 coming on 15 years ago. I went into the slums of the old city of Hyderabad in South Central India. And there I found, you know, it was an extraordinary experience. Um, a private school in the slums. It was a low cost private school in those days, charging about one US dollar equivalent per month. Um, and then I found another and another, and then there was this federation of 500 of these private schools. And I realized this was my life had changed. I'd become convinced through my PhD about the value of private education. And here I was finding hundreds, thousands of private schools serving the poor. The two parts of my life came together, and you know, I've never looked back. Now, my question is how does South Central India compare to South Central LA? Mm. I've never been to South Central LA, <laughs> but it yeah. sounds like I, it sounds like the sort of place I would love to go. Uh, absolutely, yeah. um, you know but, one of the things I love. Is it, the, I'm sorry. Is it is it is it a, is it a poor dis, 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 disadvantaged yeah, neighborhood? Yeah, it's it, probably it, it, about it, the same. Uh, I'm sure yeah. maybe the colors are different that you get to wear, but uh, I'm sure it's the, the yeah. same but, but, living conditions. Okay. So, so let's move from India. Let's go to the slums of Monrovia in Liberia, where I, my latest work has been in Sierra Leone, Liberia, South Sudan, because I figured the countries I work, were, was working in before. My, my God, really you, you, just, you just named the three countries. I, I just, we had Warren Buffett's son on who has been doing work there trying to get farming, you know, uh, just basically yeah. trying to change the way they ag do agriculture and things. Talk about problems. Yep. You know, I, I said to my friend today, uh, you follow the conflicts and you say just a little prayer every night that you weren't born uh, at you weren't born in one of those countries in the 90s or even 2000 or even today. Mm -hmm. It is so bad. And what those warlords well, did and what that conflict did. And obviously, well, yeah. so the, the, the war is no longer a problem in Sierra Leone, Liberia. It is right. in South mm -hmm. Sudan, but obviously we've got Ebola. But Ebola is not... There's, you know, it's a huge problem for outsiders, but malaria and other things are much bigger killers in those countries. Yep. But nonetheless, 
the, ish, the, the, the key thing I wanted to impress upon you, we've just, we've just done research there, I'm running chains of schools in Sierra Leone and, and other parts of West Africa, Ghana. Um, but the key thing is the slums of Monrovia, Liberia, the poorest slums on this planet, 71% of the children in those slums go to private schools. 8% go to government public schools, as you say there. Um, and 21% are out, out of school. So you've got this extraordinary revolution happening in the poorest places on the planet, and those children are in private schools, those private schools are outperforming the government schools. And the cost of sending a child to a private school is not, to a parent, is not that different from the cost of sending a child to a government school. Because in a government school, you have to still have to pay for uniforms, books, transport, lunch, PTA fees, exam fees. The cost of sending a child to a government school is about 75% of the cost of sending a child to a private school. So, so anyway, that's, that's a story in these, these countries we're working in now. Now, the difference between there and South Central LA might well be that there's no welfare dependency. There's, well, there's no welfare. There's no welfare dependency in these countries we're working in. You've got to do stuff for yourself, otherwise you sink. And, um, and you know, the, these places, well, the slums of Monroe, I find very safe, uh, safe places. I can wander around there at night and not feel threatened. I doubt if the same is true of South Central LA. So there's a difference. Wow. But I, want, I wonder whether the model could work there too. I don't know. Yeah, you not? know what? I definitely believe it could. One of the interesting things in your book that you mentioned was uh, the fact that non-certified teachers can get the same results as certified teachers. And I think that's one of the yeah. major differences between a public and private school in that I think a lot of teachers get turned away from public education because here they are qualified uh, historians or uh, you know, English majors or they've written books or, or whatever, mathematicians, but then they have to go to school for another like four or five years and then uh, be able to enter where, like, if you want to be a professor at a university, like, there's not that same requirement. But for some reason, to, to teach in a public school, you have there's to jump a, through all these be, Yeah, yeah, there's a whole core curriculum you have to be. What were you well, say? the other thing is, that, you know, I work in private education. I'm a private tutor and get paid very well for it. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, if you go to the very, the very, very top levels of secondary education, the most expensive tutors, they're not credentialed. No, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, that's the thing the 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 people who really can afford to pay, they know what they're actually shopping on and they're not shopping on. Oh, do you have a teaching certification? They're shopping on. And I think that's a large part. Well, of that's what, what that's what uh, Professor you say. Right. I mean, it, the parents are the ones it, it's not just parents, but yeah. parents, are the ones who are, ta are the, <laughs> they're the ones who are the most invested in their children's lives. They are holding teachers accountable. They're they're pa spending right. this one dollar a month or whatever it is, but they want yeah. results. Right. Yeah. So, so it was said just now that the, you know, the, the, the people who can afford the most aren't worried about credential teachers. The people who can afford the least are not worried about credential teachers either, which is the extraordinary thing. Why not? Well, because in the poor areas, credential teachers, government teachers have three huge disadvantages. One is sometimes they don't turn up. Um, and even if they do turn up, they don't necessarily teach. They get kids to do other stuff in the mm. classrooms. And thirdly, the government teachers tend to be, um, as it were, throw, uh, flown in from outside, you know, so they're not from the poor places. They tend to, they can despise the poor people. You know, they look down on them, think of them being dirty, smelly, and so on. And so you get the situation where the teachers from outside, the government teachers, they might be highly credentialed, but they don't turn up, they don't teach and they despise the kids. What would you prefer? Would you prefer someone from your community who is not highly credentialed but turns up every day, teaches all the time, and identifies totally with your children? Of course. Well, you know, of course. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's this. And, 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 and these, and these, uh, these non-credentialed teachers get better results. I mean, I, I can tell you so many stories about that, about, about the difference here. But here's one. I was in a fishing village in Gujarat. It's a little fishing village called Sikha. In, in, in this is India on the Pakistan border, talking to the fishermen fathers and the fishmonger wives, and they were telling me how bad the local government school was. But one of them told me the story. He thought it was so bad, it, his daughter was getting such a rubbish education in the government school. He went to the school to complain. The 
Credentialed teachers saw him coming. They phoned the police and had him arrested and chucked in jail for uh, uh, abusing them. This was a poor father who wanted to go and complain. You can imagine they saw this smelly, dirty, illiterate fisherman coming. What did he know about education? Let's arrest him and get rid of him. What did he know about education? He knew that his children, his child, his daughter was not learning. And no one in the village was learning because the teachers, they weren't bothered. But that's a sort of reality, but that's a bad news story. The good news story is these private schools are everywhere. There's going to be one in that village soon. I'm building one, actually. Well, there's even better news. There's even better news. Your Mm. book, your book has taken hold. Your your book is being embraced by even the, some of the aid agencies and things and education, you know, that that you've criticized. I mean, this, this idea of yours then the then these ideas have have really taken hold and they are beating out the bad ideas that's what i love about this yes. that's that's what i yeah. think is so and, amazing and, about this yeah and we don't have to overdo that because i, I you know sometimes I, I think i'm winning the war and i realize i've just won a couple of battles um because sure. because uh, the, the, you know as you've so sort of hinted at these ideas were immensely unpopular um by the by, those in the development uh, establishment, because basically, what the book says is very simply is that the poor are are saying we don't want the sixty five years of development consensus, which says the only way to educate us is through government schools. We want something different. They're voting with their feet and saying we want something different. This was very unpopular with the development experts. They didn't like having the poor say no thanks. What a surprise! Um, yeah, what a surprise. And uh, you know, what I thought was really amazing. Was in I didn't know this, but before the British colonized India, India had their own universities and their own schools. They had a school system and a very extensive one, which um, I was surprised yeah. by. I shouldn't have well, been surprised. I, I, mean, I shouldn't have been, but I no, I, I was. You were you were you were no more surprised than I was. I mean, that was an extraordinary. That so that so there's the book is a journey through continents and countries. That chapter is a journey through time mm. where um, I went back to, yeah, before the British came, the, there were these village schools. And, and the way I got to it was a remark that uh, Mahatma Gandhi made in 1931 when he was in London um, fighting, uh, fighting for independence in some ways. And he said, before the British came to India, we were more literate and the British came and uncovered the root of the beautiful tree in it, Paris, which is, of course, where the title of the book comes right. from. Um, and I went, back to, I went back to the British collectors, the British um, you know, uh, authorities. They had done a research, a bit like my research, <laughs> some hundreds of years later, but they had done research themselves, gone into every village and found, to their, to their surprise, there were these village schools, these, and they were private schools. They were low-cost private schools. So in a sense, what's happening is um, the poor are reclaiming that tradition that, that was there before the British. But it's not that, that was in know, India. And by, and by the way, you know, it's it's just when you say the poor, it's also this is common sense. This is what people do. People are resourceful. People can be self-reliant when left alone. That is what happens. Marketplaces just happen. People barter. People communicate. It becomes this living, breathing organism. You know, you write very well, by the way. I mean, describing your journey into, I think it was in, in, uh, it was in Nigeria, and just the filth, but, the, but how, also how teeming with life it was. The, the women gutting the fish, and, and the, you know, mm. the, it, was, it was all kind of moving and working. Um, and I thought that was fascinating. It, and it's just, it compounds my conviction that people can figure out how to solve their own problems most of the time yeah. yes they need help sometimes yes you know you there everybody needs a helping hand sometimes but but it does seem that and there's so much evidence to suggest that just giving a lot of aid from well-meaning people who don't necessarily know the people on the ground, they don't understand the nitty gritty, the devil's always in the details. That is way more destructive than helpful. And so it, th- this yeah. book is a joy to read in that sense. I mean, and, and I'm so happy that people are, are coming over to your side on this, you know? Yeah. Right? Well, that, that's, I mean, that's very, 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 very kind of you to say that, but, well, uh, just, you know, and, and, 
those experiences of going into those slums, you know, they, they, they were life-changing experiences, which was perhaps why I was able to write about them in that way. You know, you don't, you don't go into one of those slums and forget it easily. You know, it no. changes your life. And yeah, the definitely. vibrancy, the life, the experience is all there. And as you say, I, I mean, this is a key example of a spontaneous order. Um, you know, the, the slums of South Sudan or the, you know, of India or China, uh, even the rural villages of China, there's a spontaneous order, a self-organizing system emerging here. And you're dead right. Aid comes in. What does aid do in these countries? Typically, aid goes to support the government, to give the government more power. And so the people get left behind. You know, the government's more powerful. The aid supports the government. Well, not only that, how much of that money actually goes to the problem? So much of that money is 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 in the salaries of, quote unquote, consultants, uh, paperwork. I mean, they, they, I've seen yeah. the estimates. I think sometimes it's 5% of that Well, that's what that Howard money. Buffett was saying yesterday. Yeah, he we had saying, Warren Buffett's son, Howard Buffett, who wrote a book called 40 Chances on yesterday, and he was saying that, right? He was 5%. saying 5%. 5% of that money actually goes to the problem, and the rest is, is feeding the bureaucracy. I mean, talk about yeah. inefficient. So just, well, you, you know, yeah. the cool thing about so, the book is you see the importance of uh, caring parents, you know, because, it, it, I mean, that's really the catalyst of, like, if the if these students come from a home where the parents care so much about their education, you know, that's where it starts from. It, it's, you know, yeah. the, the students are getting good grades and they're doing great and the private schools are doing great. But it all starts with parents who care about their students' education. You know, my mom worked two jobs to put me and my sister through Catholic school. And there was a point where... Mm-hmm. Uh, she didn't know if she was, you know, could could keep affording it and was willing to walk the streets, prostitute herself to to make sure me and my sister had uh, education. Jesus. Uh, that's a badass. Woman. That's a badass woman. You know, Jesus. And so, you know, when you when you have parents who just like education is number one, mm-hmm. this is what we care about. Then that spills over into the, the habits of. Of, of the students, you know, and then that in turn creates a school. So, you know, sometimes you get into the argument of like, does the school make the kids good or does the, the kids make the, you know, the school, you know, perform better? And and uh, but, you know, the parents, mm-hmm. it starts with the yeah, parents. It does. And, Professor, do you find that, you know, I know that some of the challenges are what kind of education are they getting? Uh, how do you know whether or not the private education you're getting is good? Some of these parents don't necessarily have a metric for that. Um what what is your finding in that? What 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 is going on? I mean, when you have a private school that sort of comes up in in Sierra Leone, for example, and you've got teachers that are teaching these kids, what what is the quality of that education for the most part? I know it it must vary greatly, but what what are yeah. they teaching these kids? Yeah, so, so so two two things about that. One is you said parents don't necessarily have a metric. Well, they do have metrics. I mean, we're talking about, you know, how do they view primary, elementary education? Um, they want their kids to be able to speak English and, and um, write English. Um, and even if they can't speak or write English themselves, they can tell if their children are being fluently talking to, in English to their, to their neighbors and so on. They can recognize, oh, that kid's, that kid's has got much better English than my kid. Let's see which school he or she is going to. That's the one to go for. They can check books. They can see if you know, the books are, uh, I think, checked, you say, don't you, in America. We say marked in England. You know, do the teachers look at the books, uh, the, the notebooks, the, the children working in? Are the children well-behaved? Are they you know, doing all the things that you, you expect of uh, children learning? So they've got informal metrics, let's say like that. And, and they endlessly discuss these things. Mm. Women in the market will endlessly be discussing about the relative merits of the private schools in their, in their communities. But um, so that, that's the informal stuff. But formally, there, there's so much research now following on from the research we did um, comparing uh, the, the private and the, the public schools on standardized tests, you know, using standardized tests from around the world, um, perhaps adjusting them for local, local, um, local uh, uh, conditions. And these tests typically, I mean, it's now almost universal, once, once or twice one or two little studies might show the contrary, but in general, widely accepted now, the tests show the private schools 
outperforming the government schools. That's including controlling for background variables, you know, household variables, and controlling for any selectivity bias. So it's very well documented that the private schools are better than the government schools Amazing. at maths, English, mathematics, English, and one or two other subjects. Amazing. Of course, they can be improved. The, the great thing is... And it is amazing, you know, I mean, that result should sink in. I mean, the development agencies now have that result rather lightly, but this is schools that have emerged out of self-help from poor communities themselves with no funding from anywhere else, nothing, and they are outperforming the heavily funded, heavily subsidised, aid-subsidised government schools. What it's a an surprise. What a surprise. Not at all. But it's... it's yeah. It's worth just reflecting on and just thinking, wow, that is incredible. You're right to delay me. It is incredible. Um, but they can be improved. Of course they can be improved. Mm. And uh, the good news is the incentives are in the right direction. The private school proprietors want these schools to be improved because if they can improve their school, they can win market share from their competitors. Right. And so right. Right. They are very I'm sure they talk. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure parents compare... Yeah. And talk, well, this school over here yeah. is better than this school because they have this. And I would imagine technology, you know, one computer, one iPad, you know, anything like that can yeah. be, must be huge. Yeah. So, so in India, technology is more important than in the African countries we're working in because it's, you know, it's slightly richer, better connected and better connected to the electricity grid. But technology will come in. I mean, in time, we'll see great improvements through technology. But at the moment, the great improvements are more through... Um, you know, focus on improving teaching, improving curriculum materials, and even, you know, working out how to make the schools more accessible to the poor, you know, to a wider market. So those are improvements that are going on pretty low tech, high, high tech ones will come in, and they will revolutionize it too. And I think the other, the one other metric that really comes out in the book that I think is worth mentioning is the emotional metric. You can see whether the teachers look at you with respect or whether mm. they look at you as a piece of dirt. Mm -hmm. mm. And I mean, that's the that's the biggest. I think the biggest difference is, is that you know you have all of these teachers who are bussed in from the the middle class suburbs, and then they come to these slum schools. Yeah. Most of them have never even been into the slums. The schools are on the outside of the slums, mm. and they have no respect right. for these children. They beat the children i mean they just don't respect them as opposed to no you're from the slum you know the families you know the parents and they're paying customers and you have that great story where you know there's some headmistress and she keeps you waiting for 45 minutes talking to somebody else and you think oh my god this woman is so incredibly rude i've been here for 45 minutes and then you and i'm the visiting white man i'm the visiting white man why is she not paying attention <laughs> hey, hey, hey. yeah and who is she talking to she came and said to me, she said, I'm sorry, but that was a parent. And it put me in my place. Damn. It was, it's some, yeah, God. that sums up the whole book, doesn't it? It really does. It does. Know? It wow. really does, man. I, I just. The it, really it, important people are not visiting white men coming from outside. Um, it's the parents it, 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 who are it, there. It, I was so discouraged yesterday because we had Warren Buffett's son on and he was talking about all the problems in the world and trying to get people to farm properly and the food shortages and all. And there are huge problems, of course. I mean, the, the Congo, yeah. he's, he's going back to the Congo on his, on his birthday uh, to go help those people. God bless him. But, but I was so depressed. And then reading your book, kind of just, I was like, you know, it, it can happen. I mean, it, especially when the right ideas take root. And this is, this is the good idea. But I think the other thing that's worth mentioning, too, is one of, the, one of the great examples that, you know, the Buffets have in their book is you go into a community, you give them a bunch of mosquito nets, you dump a thousand mosquito nets on them. Well, you've now destroyed the livelihood of the guy who made mosquito nets for a living, and now there's no <laughs> mosquito nets. And when those net. mosquito nets are yes. kind of tattered and torn in three right. years, yeah. there's nobody to replace those or fix those mosquito nets. And, nobody has the skill set. Yeah. And to go back to Leo's point, and this is one of the points that you really make in the book, when you prov when you dump free education into a community, mm -hmm. you destroy the possibility of private education. So would you know? Would I ever consider, for example, in South Central Los Angeles, setting up a s private school? Probably not. 
because, you know, there doesn't seem to be a lot of money there. You know, there's already a free government school. How can you compete with that? But if there was no free government school and the marketplace was allowed to compete, you would find increasingly better schools developing and I, I will bet well, you, I will bet you that there are a lot of parents in South Central, et, et cetera, in this country that well, would like love Well, Leo's absolutely. mom. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, you yeah. know, and I but, think... But, but, the, but on, but on yeah. The uh, yeah, I, mean, I think just, what just... you do in South Central LA is, you know, there's always a need for something. Like public schools can only teach you so many subjects and specialize in so many things. And uh, you know, like I think about like I went to a private school, uh, for middle school, fourth through eighth grade, and even though it was a private school and you know it cost so much money, there were so many other things I wasn't offered. There, there weren't any art classes specifically uh, in terms of teams. There weren't a lot of team sports, just basketball. Where like if you go to a public school, you're offered more extracurricular activities, sporting events. Um, you're offered more typically recreational activities in terms yeah, of like art, music, music, and art, and all that, and stuff. all those different things. Yeah, you have your larger class sizes, but you're also exposed to a, a wider diversity of people. Mm. So, like, if you go to like a public high school, you know, you know, if there's always a group there that's willing to accept you in. You know, yeah. there's a tribe or a group that you can find. Whereas I think like when you go to a private school, everybody's pretty much on the same page. So if, if you don't fit in, then you're just not in, <laughs> you know. So like there are all these pros and cons. So I wonder, Professor, like, <laughs> are you advocating yeah. for like an all or nothing approach between private and public schools? Or are you just saying that there is a, there's a place for private schools and there is a place for public schools? Well, the good news is it doesn't matter what I'm saying in a way. What I'm cataloguing in these countries is that in these poor communities and in the richer communities too, no one wants to go to public school. So it's the opposite from what you've described where public school is the place to go. The majority of kids in public school in America, no. In these places, the majority of kids are in private school. Private schools are the places where you know that everyone is and where you can fit into whatever niche you want. Public school is is becomes the you know the the marginalized place so it doesn't matter what i think if you want to know what i think i think this the poor have discovered a pretty good solution and it seems like something to support rather than object to but it, just going back to south central la or similar communities in america um I mean, what really struck me, I, 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 I wrote another book where I had a couple of chapters about American charter schools. What really struck me there was two things. One was how difficult it was and how politicized it was to get a charter school going. But secondly, there were these enormous um, queues, lines, uh, waiting lists for charter schools. And I wondered whether if you've got all these people who are desperately waiting to get into a charter school, you know the film Waiting for Superman where it's just this terrible um, lottery to get into a charter school and if you fail, you feel your child has failed. I wonder whether those sort of parents would be more like, um, would be more like Leo's parents, um, uh, mother, you know, and they would be the ones who would be willing to pay for a private school if you could get the cost low enough. And I reckon you could get the cost much lower than private schools are today. So I'm I'm interested in, I, I in America too. I agree with you. I agree with you, and I I'm I wouldn't be surprised if your book and the ideas in this book take hold in a lot of these uh, a lot of our communities in this country, our underprivileged communities in this country. Man, I wouldn't be surprised at all. And I think so much of yeah. that. Yeah. Well, what I was going to say is I think this, what's so important in terms of that is not just the journey across continents, but that journey across time. Because our historical memory, we have this idea that in the past, everybody was illiterate, and then there was finally government schooling, and then universal literacy was achieved. Mm -hmm. And why would you ever remove government schooling? Because you'll just send us back to essentially the Middle Ages. <laughs> yeah, and that's not true. That's not true. Um, now, I, I know the history of your country not as well as I know my own, but E.G. E. West, the professor I told you about, interests me so much. He's written about the history in New York and Massachusetts, and it's very similar to the history in England and Wales. And very briefly, that is, in 1858, before the state, before government got involved in education, which was in 1870, 95.5% of children were in school for on average 5.7 years. This was a government report. So the same, those low-cost private schools that were there in the poor areas of England, and it was the same in New York and Massachusetts, the government 
jumped into the saddle of a horse that was already galloping. I think I think that you can break. I don't care where you're from, what your culture is. I think everybody, human beings, want two things usually. They want a say in yeah. who governs them, and they want a better life for their kids. That, that I, I I think yeah. that is as human as yeah. you know breathing air. Yeah. And and it is. And that's where this. That's why this this works. That's why this is happening. It feels like. Well, but yeah. I, th- I think it's also it's a rediscovery of what we used to have. Mm. I mean, you know, if you look at the intellectual climate of 1776, which is obviously the date that Americans tend to look back to, mm-hmm. there's a great yeah. quote in David McCulloch's book, which won the Pulitzer, 1776, where he says, they lived in a time when it was believed that a man by serious and diligent application to books could teach himself whatever was required. There was an understanding that education came from you plus book. And yeah. that was the only thing that was really required. Whereas now people have so bought into the mythology of, you know, oh, you need the fancy university, you need the fancy institution, you need the teacher, the tutor. There's all these middlemen that have come between person plus book. What, what about that, Absolutely. Professor? What about college now? What about higher education and this model? Well, I, I mean, there, there are there, there is a burgeoning private sector in higher education too, but uh, you know, it, it's not my area of of, of research. Right. Um, but 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 it's it's definitely a burgeoning area, and the, and the thing about private higher education in the developing world is that the the public education is typically quite good. You know, it's it's the one area of education that that doesn't work so badly as the others in mm. in in these. It is there for the elite. Um, the private higher education deals for the the less well off. So it's a continuation of this theme. Um, but I, you know, I, I wouldn't pretend, pretend to be an expert on it. But just just going back to what you're saying about America, I, I was in New York a few weeks back. I, I took a taxi very early one morning um, from Times Square to JFK, and the taxi driver was. Um, uh, from ha- Haiti, he'd been in New York 32 years. I told him what I was doing in New York, that I'd been giving a talk about low-cost private schools in Africa and Asia. He said, you must do that here. People like me, people like us us taxi drivers, we would come to your schools. You must do it here. When are you going to start? And where was so, this? Where was this? You know, where? That was in New York. Oh, that's a terrible. Times that's, Square a terrible and, that's a terrible New York accent, Professor, but keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I mean, whatever. I guess he was from. I suppose he spoke the Queen's English. Uh, right, right. I'm sorry, sorry. Keep going. That was me getting excited. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I mean, listen, man. It's it's everybody wants it, and uh, it seems it seems that uh, I'm just so happy that your book is taking hold. And uh, I, what are you working on next? What's the next revolution here, Professor? Well, I, so so since the book, I've been I've been working in in countries. So I've been carrying on research, but I've been working in countries to develop chains of these low cost private schools. I've been working on a couple myself and encouraging others to do them. So one chain is called Omega Schools. Uh, franchise limited in Ghana with a, a co-founder, a Ghanaian entrepreneur. I created this chain in 2009. The first two schools opened in 2009. By 2013, four years later, we had 20,000 students and um, uh, uh, and f- 38 schools. We're having a year of consolidation now, and we're going to expand again. We've got invest big investment for that chain, yeah. and and so this is this particularly excites me now. Creating chains of these schools, um, really bringing the cost down. Uh, we, you know, this is a, a a model that fits in very much with the lifestyle of the poor. We have a an all inclusive daily fee in these schools. Uh, why? Because the cash flow of the poor in these countries is daily. So we're trying to fit in with you know, their requirements, like any private sector should, um, and, and recognizing that if they pay daily, um, you know, they, they, they can, more, more parents can come. So our schools are typically full after a few weeks. And, uh, you know, it's a very exciting project. We've got big investment. Uh, I, I, as, as you're talking, I swear to God, I'm thinking to myself, if the acting thing doesn't work out, 
after a while, maybe I'll just quit this. Business. Maybe I'll quit this goddamn business in <laughs> ten years, and I'll look up Professor Tooley and go, "Hey, I want a job." And I'll come. I had this fantasy of just being. I want to wear linen, and I want to teach kids. I don't know why linen. It just it was hot in some of those countries. And I want to walk around. Out with yeah, some dreads. I want to yeah, be. A, I, I want to be a quirky old man who gives a shit. <laughs> um, and I might even. I might even affect an English accent because I love the way you speak. I could listen all day. I love it. Um, yeah. You, you are making. I'm trying to difference. sound as much American as I can. You I'm can't. You're doing a horrible like job. You're 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 way too eloquent for that, my friend. Stick to fixing the world Stick. because your American accent. Yeah. <laughs> Stick to fixing the world. You you know I said to Hunter, we this podcast is about in, uh, interviewing people that are making a difference. You're making a huge difference, and it started before this. But the book is a Be- the beautiful tree: a personal journey into how the world's poorest people are educating themselves. I think everybody should read this. I've read it. I'm going to read it again. And mainly because I want to talk about it a lot at cocktail parties and make myself sound super smart. <laughs> and then I'm going to, and, and the caveat's going to be like, and by the way, in 10 years, you can kiss my ass goodbye because I'm going to change the world with Thule. That's I just got to right. make a little more money, by the way. Uh, that's it, my friend. I, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. And more importantly, right. I appreciate you um, doing what you do. I, I, you make me feel like the world is indeed a place for hope. And you make me feel that uh, things are getting better. And I love, I love your free market approach. I like your philosophy, sir. I really do. So, so thank you from going from, been, go, thanks for going it's, from it's being a terrific. socialist to, you know, to what you are. Yeah. Sorry. It's been terrific coming on here. You must join me one day. And on the 26th of January, I shall remember. <laughs> remember, remember, it is the birthday of all birthdays, sir. Uh, James Tooley, where are you? Are you in? So you are in the UK. I, I'm in the UK at the moment. Right, yeah, too bad. You, just, uh, I was going to invite you to my stand-up yeah. if you were if you were anywhere in, near Philadelphia, December 10th <laughs> to the 13th. Uh, you you have to come out. Leo usually accompanies me, and we put on a hell of a show. So I promise I can, I, I won't teach you anything, and uh, maybe Leo won't either. But we will we will make you laugh your ass off. So uh, and you deserve it. You deserve it. Uh, yeah. Terrific. Well, thanks, for, thanks for having me on. I've really enjoyed it. It's great meeting you guys. You're welcome anytime, sir. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, great book. The Beautiful uh, Tree. Bye A bye. good man. A good man. Uh, what'd you think, Leo? Uh, oh, we're still going. What? We're, we're still yeah, we're still yeah. recording. Yeah. Oh, recording. Yeah, what I'm going to start doing, everybody, is I'm going to... Um, I'm going to have these wonderful authors and thinkers and people that make a difference on. And I might do it for, you know, maybe this time we had him on for 45 minutes or 43 minutes. Next time I might, maybe it'll even be a half hour. But he was so fun to listen to. Well, I think that's really the thing. Is the guest fun? Yeah, and he's and, great. And I, I mean, I, I would also say with some of them, I'd like to try some out where you just get a group of you stand-up comedians together and just riff on an idea. That's, like, that's what I guys... want to start doing, man. Yeah, yeah that's the thing. Is like, you know, he was... He was fun, but there were so many things I was just like, nah, you know, and I just wanted to go in, but you know, like I, what, I, what, what, what didn't you? Well, you know, it's that this the idea of like, look, when, if you go into India or these third world countries where things are already crap, yeah. right? Better doesn't necessarily mean good or significant. So, like, if the graduating high school rate of, of, a high, of a school in India is 20%, and you open up a private school and it's 25%, you can say, hey, we're better. So, you know, his, his terminology, the way he was speaking was in very vague terms. It's like, you well, know. Well, he does give specific statistics I'm from sure his in, research in the book. In the book. But, yeah. it, you yeah. know, when you talk about college, right, for instance, the research shows that your um, – there's not a, a difference in terms of going to private or public school in terms of how it affects uh, you in college. If anything, it shows that public school uh, students perform better in college because they have more, uh, they're more motivated because they are paying and they don't have money to fall back on. So uh, it's, this, it's, that, it's that idea of like, you know, these parents out there spending all this money on private education for kindergarten. You know, and they just want their kids to get a jump. And, yeah, their kid can maybe, you know, read uh, Cat in a Hat by, like, three or whatever. But that, like, that that jump start, all that levels out by, like, 
second grade or whatever it is. Well, I think that Tuli was saying, you know, it doesn't matter what he thinks. The, the fact of the matter is people are taking control where if you look at India, yeah. there's been 60, 70 years longer than that of of essentially what the British put into place, centralized, bureaucratic public school systems that have fucking failed miserably. And, you, right. I mean, yeah. and there is, there's more yeah. than 25%. The, the, the differences that these schools are making are significant. They are significant. And, you know, what I find, the lesson that I find more important is that individuals, people, parents on the ground That's in these communities, the these people changer. know what's up. Absolutely. And, and, and the, Tenet to keep in mind whenever you're talking about government, structuring any kind of government or rule, people know what's best for them right, better absolutely. than we do. I mean, you get local. Like if you go into a local economy, you know, people know what that what local they need. economy needs. Absolutely. They just know because of like what you were talking about. So th- I think that that for me is the big lesson here. You know, you, you Hunter, can always speak about – Hunter knows he wrote a great book. Did you read uh, the Straight A Conspiracy? I haven't, dude. I have to read it. You know, Hunter's been Hunter really has spent so much time in the trenches and really studying how it is we learn and how it is we don't learn. Mm-hmm. And you know, that's that's what I've always found. You, you, your your point of view on even American education is it's not about more money. It's not about more resources. It isn't. In fact, it's about a shift in consciousness. It's a shift in how we approach learning, how we teach kids, right? Well, it goes back to what Leo was saying about the parents. What are the messages that the parents are sending? Is education important or is education not? And on the most fundamental level, I mean, the United States is consistently in the top four or five in the world in per student spending. We actually Mm -hmm. spend a lot of money. We get terrible return on our investment. You know, the Republic of Vietnam, which has a per capita GDP less than the Republic of Congo beat us in the mm-hmm. most recent set of international tests. Jesus. Um, so, and Vietnamese? Yeah. <laughs> they beat us in the war, and now they're beating us in education. <laughs> um, but the, the, what ends up happening is, is that if you look, a large part of it is, is that it's this very sort of technocratic approach to education where it's we're going to test all the kids. We're going to see what they've learned. You know, if the system isn't working, then it must be that we need more numbers, right? We need mm-hmm. to spend more. We need to buy more iPads. It all becomes about you know, physical resources Absolutely. rather than becoming about emotionally what's going on. Who do oh. we have on who was talking about that? Well, who did we, we had somebody on recently. Why am I blanking on the, uh, the fin- finish lessons? Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. About- but I mean, if you, what, what's interesting and, you know, I, I talked to Professor Tooley about this via email beforehand is if you compare finish lessons, which is about government schools because Finland's government schools work really, really well, Mm -hmm. and then you compare it with what his book is about, which is about free market solutions, Mm -hmm. the big, big difference, like it seems to be that they're opposed. Patsy Salberg. Yeah. Thank you, Lena. But the the big difference seems to be market versus government, but the actual, the common thread is emotion. You know, teachers in Finland really respect education. They Mm -hmm. think it's a noble profession. It's one of the highest prestige professions. And so they're incredibly emotionally engaged in, you know, making a difference in their kids' lives. It's also a very homogenous society. I mean, Finland is an egalitarian. It's actually, I mean, it's less so than you think. I mean, you have to remember that Finland has two national languages, Swedish and Finnish, which are totally unrelated languages. One's like closer to Hungarian. Yeah, Finnish is a Finnegurkic language, so it's related. Finnegurkic. Thank you, Hunter Mott. There you go. Talk about a big brain, bro. Yeah. Wow. He'll just come up with crazy I, shit. I'm just still pr- trying to pronounce wines. <laughs> fin- <laughs> fin- <laughs> but it's related to Estonian and Hungarian and all of that stuff. Right. And then you have Swedish, which is a Germanic language, is related to you know Danish, Norwegian, German, Dutch, English. Wow. Um, Jesus, all that's in your head. Oh, bro. Like he you're speaks. Not he even speaks. <laughs> he speaks like googling. <laughs> he, spe- he speaks like give or take nine languages. But, 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 but see, the important lesson here. Here is is that like even when you say something like all that's in your head, mm-hmm. we think that that's like our model of intelligence and memory is is that it's about storage capacity, right? You're mm-hmm. eff- effectively you're saying, oh my god, like I thought I thought you know my memory was big, but your memory must be twice as big. But it's not about size; it's about organization and it's about emotion and it's about connections and emotional relations and it's how the information is organized that makes it memorable. Um, right. And that's if you if you've got 
for example, like this, the sort of model of memory that you're talking about mm -hmm. is what 99% of Americans have, which is, you know, it's basically that the mind is a hard drive mm -hmm. and you ram facts in there yes. and you just keep on ramming facts in there. And mm -hmm. if you ram them in hard enough, then they stay. And then they're like, why I'm didn't they? I'm getting horny. Why is that? Is <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? You're talking about size. Brian and... Kellen show Joe. after hours. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. After hours. <laughs> Turn that butter, Brian. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Turn yeah. that butter. <laughs> oh, it'd be great if Thule was talking. I just kept going, yeah, <laughs> education. Ah, oh, bring it, yeah. bring it down. Get, make it smaller, more potent. It's growing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Brian Callen makes minute. education red hot. How how badly do I want you to moderate the next presidential debates and just oh, be like, good oh, point. Yeah. <laughs> good point, you fucking president, the future president. Oh yeah. 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 Good rebuttal. <laughs> oh, that rebuttal got me all creepy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Tell me Hillary. about. Yeah, tell me. <laughs> tell me what you do to Syria. And the whole Syria's time, being a naughty, naughty girl. And the whole, yeah, and the whole time I'm sitting on the edge of a stool with both my hands clasped behind my head for for some weird reason, no shirt on. Yeah. Your rebuttal. Your rebuttal. Oh, God, I'm yeah. An idiot. Jesus Christ. I, I can't. I do want to fix the world. I kind of want to be. First of all, I've not stopped thinking about killing warlords in Sierra Leone mm -hmm. and the Congo. I but want see, to kill those fuckers. Here's I the... want to kill them personally with a knife. And, 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 but then now I want to go help with education. But here's the great God. irony, Brian. You can do I don't both. know who I am. Just do both. You're a libertarian, yeah. but every time you talk about your fantasies of fixing the world, it's about you being emperor. It really is, wow. dude. It really think is. Think about that. You you are so statist. You think that that is how you fix <laughs> the world. You're goddamn right, brother. But the really But as emperor, the... I have just a lot of guns, and I'm really nice to all the, all the innocents. <laughs> oh, you're one of the good dictators? Yes, I want to protect all the schools, and I uh -huh. want... No, this is what I do as a dictator, for real. <laughs> all right, what you got? I swear to God, as a dictator, I would... I would my my true belief is I would leave those... I would... I, total hands-off governance for the yeah. most part. So in other words, those shanty towns, even the slums, I, I would take a look at how organically, what is organically working. And before I did anything, I would, it would be about, if there was any help or resource aid, it would be aid that was given on the ground level to fostering empowerment, fostering entrepreneurial ingenuity which would probably mean for the most part you'd have to step out what i would do is i'd be very instrumental in getting if there's shit in the middle of the street i would dig i would create sewer systems i would have water treatment plants i'd have sanitation those kinds of things would be fine and i might even open some of that up and some of those neighborhoods up to privatization so if you want to live in an even nicer place it might cost you a premium but our sewer system's even better whatever the case but I would be a hands up and where I would be a fucking animal and a dictator is if you got any <laughs> roving bands of shitheads who think it's okay to come in and take resources and kill and intimidate people, Get I'm going to kill there. you yeah. because with my, with my masked yes. crack team of commandos. Yeah. Now, go, like, Brian, I'm telling you, you want to come into villages in Sierra Leone, Freetown, I would have set up. I mean, I don't. I would have just said armor tanks. Ask. But yeah. so these so, armor tanks that you have and helicopter and gun helicopter ships. gunships. Yeah. How are you paying for them? <laughs> Shut up, Hunter. With your are details. You, are gold, you, gold. <laughs> I must tax. Exactly. Well, there see, would be a small. Oh, I have that's to tax that's a why you bit. put microchips in everybody, <laughs> and then as soon as you see them acting up, you just hit the button and they're done. This that's is an it. amazing Their idea. That's up. it. What I would do is you have. There is always some taxation to be a flat tax, mm -hmm. uh, maybe ten percent, and th and that money would. Would be your that friends have to pay it? No. <laughs> Not if they're hot. <laughs> yeah, I, def exactly. I definitely wouldn't be married. Yeah. I'd be like, hey, honey, sorry, I'm an emperor now. Gots yeah. to have me a harem. Mm -hmm. She could be number one wife. And would you, for example, decide that you know the <laughs> oil wealth and the mineral wealth of the nation should be devoted to those sorts of improvement projects, and so therefore have to be that wealth has to be centralized? Would you decide that? No, but here's what I would do. Is that how you would? Pay if you for have it? a mining operation, you've got to teach. You've got to teach the local population all the skills it takes to mine so i create an economy around a local economy around that mine that was good brian <laughs> <laughs>
That was mm-hmm. one of your best I, I read, dictator I moments. I read mm. Darren Asamagala. I know yeah. how na- why nations fail. Problem with what they did, what the South Africans did, the Boers and the, the English, is that they they took all those diamonds out of the mines. But if you were black, you only were allowed to learn how to dig. You weren't taught. They didn't create generations of of people who understood how to carve diamonds, how to how to operate high tech machinery, how to fix high tech machinery, all those things. That was white people. Mm-hmm. If you're black, man, you, you're going to be digging in rocks. That's what you get for the rest of your fucking life. And we're going to take all the diamonds and we're going to extract those diamonds and we're going to sell them overseas and other people are going to get rich. But you guys keep working. I know it's your land, but you guys keep working for us, you slaves. That is the legacy of colonialism for the most part. And we're still paying for it. Places like India Always. and Africa yeah, are still you know, paying. It's that idea. like You can't keep people down or someone down without keeping yourself down. And so, like, they're thinking short term in terms of the profits from the diamonds, but you don't think about the long term in terms of what could be gained for humanity, you know, because in those in those minds, you know, are are geniuses and creative people who have ideas about how to make the world better and grow. But we got them digging ditches. It's a waste somewhere. of a mind, of course. It's a waste of a mind. But yeah. we'll never know because, you know, we're not letting them out and. I kind of see like the, the, you know, some schools like that, you know, just tying it all back to the schools of like, it's not, I don't think it's so much private versus public. You know, I kind of feel like that's like Crips versus blood. You that's, know? A good, that's a good <laughs> like, point. That's actually like, a good is point. It, like, which is better, you know, because the truth is, is what a parent does or what a good parent should do is you explore your options. You you find a school that is suitable for your child. Very right? good point. And because if you if you go to privatization and then now it's owned by Microsoft, so they got this monopoly on schools. That means most of the schools are going to be run the same way, but in a way that's going to benefit their corporation in the long term, right? When uh, Microsoft isn't going to have programs with sports or whatever because they don't need uh, a football team or a lacrosse team. They need, uh, you know, engineers and things of that nature. You even see it at the college level where um, uh, uh, on the East Coast and like, what what is it in North Carolina with those three schools? What do they call that? Um, you mean UNC? And the UNC, UNC, but there's a name for that triangle oh, or whatever. the research triangle? Yeah, the absolutely. Durham. Yeah. So even like with those schools, and you see it a lot with uh, black schools also, like they get funded by these corporations. But the school can only receive the funding if the schools agree to not teach. There was a period where schools had to agree to not teach entrepreneurialism because if they taught to entrepreneurialism, then uh, the the businesses in the area were afraid that the students wouldn't then graduate and come work for them. How about that? And that's that's amazing. Because yeah. that 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 is what one of the knocks on our the structure of our education. It goes back to the British colonial or just the British industrial age or, and, and the American we wanted to create good workers. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's it is what you said. It's cramming knowledge into the brain like a hard drive learning memory wrote all that stuff and but, you don't really learn concept and context and problem solving and collective problem solving that we were talking about in the finished schools right but that's a very interesting point i didn't know that but that's- yeah i mean if you look at the, the the public school system now the the major problem is is that everything they do is geared towards getting good test grades well, if you do everything towards getting good SAT scores, which is a poor predictor of how you're going to be. All research has shown that your SAT scores is a poor predictor of how you perform in college. Your grades is a better indicator of how you perform in college than your SAT scores. So it's already like it, it's it's a ridiculous uh, standard to even have. But the, down, the other downside of that is that... Um, like you said, kids don't the teachers don't really have the room or space to teach kids so that they have that emotional connection to the material. Right. They're on the program. A lot of schools you go into. Oh, you were talking about you taught for a while and you couldn't touch the kids. Right. Yeah. You, you can't you can't touch the kids. One, uh, two, there uh, most schools have it where every class has to be on the same page and same chapter every week. So that's that core even, curriculum stuff. Mm-hmm. Yes, but it, it goes. It goes back before that. I mean, it's all. I mean, what Posse Salberg was talking about. You know, no child left behind was the same thing. The idea is, oh, we're gonna just standardize. You know, you have to know Learning. these things, Absolutely. and you know, and then you spend an incredible amount of your time just trying to prep for these tests, and that's all you're doing. 
Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And, and, you know, that where's the where's the room for a conversation in the classroom? So now if I'm a teacher and I recognize that the book has old information or false information, I have to continue teaching that because that's what's going to be on the test as opposed to let's explore these concepts and these ideas of war and these ideas of slavery and these ideas of capitalism, which is crazy to me. We live in a capitalist society and that is not taught. Right. Like you go to China, they know what communism is. They understand the, how it works, the rules, the laws and everything like that. But our society revolves around capitalism, but at no level is it ever taught. And I think what's happening now is like kids see that like they see that if I learn all this stuff and I go and I get good grades and I get a job, I'm still going to get laid off, Mm. you know. So where's the motivation? Mm -hmm. Like they see their parents with college degrees getting laid off. I just yesterday I live in uh, Mar in Mar Vista, but I work in uh, Marina del Rey and I saw a family, a husband, a wife and two kids on the corner like begging for for money and they didn't seem like they it, they, it looked like it was like their first day on the streets Damn. you know what i mean Damn. and and like that's hard to see you know and those kids are growing up with that visual you know in some cases the kids might grow up to be you know uh, more motivated to do well or because not. they see or that not. or not well you know that's the crazy thing too is like i grew up without a father and uh people are always like oh that had to be bad but research shows if People who grow up without fathers actually are more successful. They get more resourceful. They get they get more resourceful because now you have to be the man of the house. You have to do mm-hmm. things on your own. You're the single parent, especially if you have a younger sibling. So all this, you know, the stats, you really have to, like, look at it deeply to see what it's really saying. I went on a tangent just now. I like it, but, though, um, man. I like it. Leo Flowers. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, just just the point is like this whole public versus private. It's there there been the pros and cons to both sides is the point, and you really just have to figure out like what your what you want your child to be in, invested in, and then what your child's natural inclination is going to be. Because I think that the point I like I like how you 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 just you, you know it's not to focus on public versus private is to miss the point. Absolutely, you know? I think, and I think that applies to a lot of conversations in this country. Because, That's right, because we all do this. Yeah. Like we, I do it all the time. You fall into these two camps. Mm-hmm. This is how it is, and the versus this is how it is. Well, right. that is, again, missing the It's point. like Democrats or Republicans. And, and the truth is, there's a difference between school and education, right? School is a place you go. But, you know, like I played college football, and the one thing that f- football taught me was that if you want to be the best and, and you want to rise up the ranks – it's a, It's not about what you do uh, during practice or, you know, you doing what the coach tells you to do. It's what you do during the off hours. Do you come in before school and train? Do you stay after school and after practice and continue working on your micro skills? And those are the things that make people successful in this country. That's the great thing about capitalism. If you show up early and stay late You can succeed, but it's not about what you do in a classroom. It's about is that student going to then leave the classroom and then not only read the book the teacher told them to read, but read other books that are related to the subject so that they can have a full understanding of it. Right. You know, it's that 10,000 hours rule. So it's, yeah, public or private. It's like when we look at what makes a person successful, we forget about the intrinsic qualities, curiosity, passion. Social skills, you know, Robert Greene you had on here um, not too long ago. He talked about one of the the things in his book, Mastery, is the importance of social skills. And so the problem with public schools forcing these standardized uh, uh, tests is that the teacher then doesn't have a chance to have a conversation with the class. And so then the classmates don't really have a, a chance to have a conversation with each other because they're trying to cram in all this information, memorize it, spit it out for the test. And so now there's no social, there's no socialization of the students of these, which we all know networking, social skills, your ability to work well with others. Well, give and take is is hugely about that. Well, and also the the problem is, is that what's easy to measure is not often what's worth measuring. Absolutely. It's easy to measure, okay, Mm. do you know that the world is... That's really interesting. That's a great thing to say. Thanks. What's easy to measure is not... uh, It's not not necessarily worth worth measuring. And and part of the problem is that 
you know, it becomes what's easy to measure is do you know a bunch of facts? And so that's what right. school ends up becoming. But the in terms of just the I mean, you know, yes, the socialize, socialization, the emotional awareness, mm -hmm. you know, the belief in yourself so Absolutely. that you actually apply yourself. All of those things are very hard to measure. And, you know, but those are the things that are really important. And even in terms of the knowledge itself, it's not even about part of what Posse Salberg was talking about is, is that even if you know like measuring facts is easy measuring mm -hmm. how the facts are related and work together absolutely. is hard those it's tests are difficult. really expensive and really hard to design absolutely and so what ends up happening is is that you know you move away from understanding and towards repetition which is right. what education has become which is exactly what we don't want in terms of striving for innovation and all of these sorts of things all yeah. right boys well on that note we've got to wrap this up um, because well, we are already well over an hour, but I love this Leo Flowers. I think it, a Brian, good addition. You may need to add another uh, another slash to the to the title of your show. <laughs> <laughs> I knew Leo Flowers would come through. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, can we just have... have this be the slashy show and just yeah. everyone? <laughs> Brian Callen slash, uh, slash, slash, slash everyone. Leo Flowers. <laughs> uh, where are you going to be, man? What are you doing stand up? Uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, with oh, you. Shit. Are you ready for that? Yeah, man. Man, I can't I'm in wait. the gym right now doing push ups. Oh, we're going to have man. a good time. That's my favorite <laughs> room. I want to be able to walk on the beach with a beach. What was the bikinis? Is that what, what they wear on yeah, the, not man. the With yeah. the little Speedo trunks or whatever? Yes, sir. Oh, you're going to go French. Listen, yeah, man, man, I'm going French, man. <laughs> I'm going to be in Miami, baby. It's got to be a thong, man. A thong? Yeah. All right, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. Uh, I can't wait. We're going to have a... That's the end of January. <laughs> yes, sir. That's my favorite room in the country, bro. I can't... Please I've never be, been to Florida. I can't please wait. Please be ready. I'm ready. You, you will, you will see ready. what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. They are... That is primarily <laughs> Latin. There are so many beautiful oh. colors in that place. I love South Florida, oh, man. That man. air is sticky. There's not a flat ass to be found on the men or the women. And uh, <laughs> it is a, it is, and, and there is this Latin yes. flavor. A flavor, fire. But, there, but, but there's also this African and this European. It's, it's a melting pot in the best sense of the word. Love they it. come to laugh. And yes. I, you have to understand yes. that I am Cubanos, baby. <laughs> when I get there, I am from South America. My, my, my boy. <laughs> Puerto Rican, my Colombian, my Venezuelan, my my everything, it comes up like fire for me, and I want to do nothing but salsa, I want to make love, I want to wear sombreros, I want to smoke cigars, I want to have a good time, baby. Anyway, sorry, sorry, man, I can't oh, wait. Man. You got me riled up. For long day, we're coming. Philadelphia, I'll be there December 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th. Come correct. That's I love how, how after all of that, you then throw in Philadelphia. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to The Brian Callen Show with Brian Callen. Be sure to like him on Facebook. Just search for Brian Callen Comedy. And follow him on Twitter. Just search for at Brian Callen. You can also find him online by visiting his website. Just go to briancallen.com. Until next time, bye-bye. Bye-bye.